For those of you who are watching online this morning, the title of my sermon is Greater Lessons to be Learned. The lectionary text has us jumping from the sixth chapter of Mark to the sixth chapter of John. We'll be in the John for the next few weeks, and I am happy about that because John is my favorite gospel. I find it so poetic and full of Jesus's explanation about eternal life in him. I love the Word of God. I crave it and I need it. And one of the perks of being a pastor is that it gives me the opportunity to go deeper into Scripture to see what greater lessons can be learned from a passage of Scripture. I don't know how you read Scripture as part of your morning daily devotional time, but I read the Bible from cover to cover. And when I'm reading, I'm reading the story as a whole. And sometimes the Spirit will reveal to me a lesson from Scripture and how it applies to my life. That has happened more times than I can count. The lectionary text that we have today is a familiar story to everyone, the feeding of the 5,000. Now what's really interesting about this familiar story is that at that is it is i'll get it out in a minute it is as the only miracle that jesus performed that is recorded in all four gospels typically you only find these types of miracles recorded in the gospels of matthew mark and luke so let's hear these words from the gospel of john chapter 6 verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was about to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them the, to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Beloved, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is a familiar story and pretty straightforward, right? However, if we take the time to read this passage of scripture more slowly and more deliberately, we start to discover some greater lessons from this passage of scripture. And this is true of all scripture. So let me read the scripture to you again, but slower, deliberately, and with lots of pauses. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? 
He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples to gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force, he, to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So did you hear something new in this deliberate reading of the text? Does it prompt you with more questions than answers? Our daily devotional time provides us with the opportunity to read scripture in silence and solitude. Small groups, however, are a wonderful place to study scripture because everyone sees something different in scripture. And we may, we never know what the Holy Spirit may reveal to someone about the scripture we are studying. I've personally seen this over and over again in our growth group. I'm a firm believer in small groups. Our growth group has been meeting for over five years now, and I'm always amazed at how the Holy Spirit works in our group time together by revealing something new, even for people who are already familiar with Scripture. Let's examine our Scripture reading this a little closer and see what questions it may bring to mind and what greater lessons can be learned. The first sentence in this scripture reading says, The Sea of Galilee was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, but why is it mentioned? And why, what is the significance of that? This verse causes us to do a little research. The Sea of Tiberias is mentioned three times in the Gospel of John, but nowhere else in scripture. So researching this a little further, we find that the sea was adjoining the sea, there was a city adjoining the Sea of Galilee. This adjoining city was one which King Herod had beautified and enlarged for Rome. So in honor of this, the city was named for the second Roman emperor, Tiberius, and thus the Sea of Galilee was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. Our scripture says a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up onto the mountain and sat down with his disciples. These two verses seem pretty straightforward, right? But if we pause to think about it, it does bring more questions to mind. Why does Jesus separate himself from the crowd? Jesus takes notice of the crowd that follow him, and he sees the poor and ordinary people of this country. These are the multitudes that make up the people in such remote corners of this country. Jesus shows himself pleased with their attendance and concerned for their welfare. And so this scripture teaches us to also be concerned with those of low status. The souls of the poor are precious to Christ, and they should be to us as well. So as we dwell and ponder on scripture, more can be revealed to us than first meets the eye. 
greater lessons are to be learned. So let's get back to the question of why does Jesus separate himself from the crowd? Jesus positions himself advantageously so as he is able to talk to them and to teach them. The place where he went up onto the mountain was more convenient to be seen and to be heard by the multitude of, the, of those who crowded around him. This was a natural pulpit from which he could teach the crowds. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of John does not mention that Jesus taught the crowds all day long, but the same account in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. They also tell us when it was evening, the disciples asked Jesus to send the crowd away so that to the neighboring villages to buy food for themselves. So here is where we pick up again in our scripture reading this morning. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Of all of his disciples, all 12 of his disciples who were there with him, why does Jesus single out Philip by name? We read in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John that Philip was one of the first disciples Jesus called. He had seen all of his miracles and in particular that of turning water into wine. Anyone who has been a witness to Christ's works and having shared in the benefit of them are inexcusable if they say, can he furnish a table in this wilderness? But Jesus said this to test Philip's faith. God tests people to refine their faith, but never to tempt them to do evil. But if we continue to dig further into the scripture, we discover that Philip was from Bethsaida, which was the closest town, and he would have known the local resources. The answer to Jesus' question was that it was impossible, humanly speaking, for thousands of people to get bread in, in late, this late in the day from the little neighboring villages. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. Scholars put the number, actual number of people somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people. That many people requires a lot of bread. Andrew speaks up and says, there is a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. Andrew is one of the disciples standing around Jesus. But who was the boy? We know that there are many women who traveled around with Jesus. So it is not too far-fetched to believe that there were also probably some children belonging to the women who traveled around with him. So let's talk about the provision on hand, five barley loaves and two fish. When we think about bread, we typically think about wheat bread, which is the most common type of bread. So why the barley loaves? Why the barley loaves? This provision was coarse and ordinary, just the kind of food that the poor, ordinary folks of that country had on hand. This brings to my mind that we should always be content and thankful for what we have. Barley loaves of bread was what Jesus had there, and it is better than we deserve. Nor should we despise the meager provisions of the poor, nor look upon it with contempt. Our scripture says that when Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them as much as they wanted, so also the fish. Amongst devout Jews, giving thanks before and after a meal was common practice, and we need to remember that Jesus was Jewish. We also should give thanks to God for our food, for it is a mercy to have it, and we have it from the very hand of God. So we must receive it with thanksgiving, whether our provision may be coarse and scant, or whether we have plenty, we must be give thanks for what we have. Do you give thanks to God before your meals, whether in private or in public? 
Our family tradition is to hold hands and to bow our heads in prayer and someone will offer a prayer for the food, giving thanks to God. We know it is a blessing from God and we are thankful for it. The next part of our scripture says, when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. We must always take care to make no waste of any of God's good provisions. Did your mother ever tell you as a child to eat everything on your plate because there are starving children in the world? Mine did. And I despise that to eat those things that I hated, namely beets and squash. <laughs> Though Jesus could command supplies whenever he pleased, he had the fragments gathered up. When we are filled, we must, must remember there are others in need. And when we may be in need ourselves at some point in the future. Had this broken meal been left upon the grass, the wild animals and birds would have eaten it up. That which is fit to be a meal for us is wasted and lost if it is thrown to the wild animal and birds. Verse 13 says, They gathered up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. On a normal reading of this text, we may think, Wow, they gathered up twelve baskets of leftovers. Jesus performed a miracle and multiply the food so that everyone ate and was satisfied. But if we study this scripture, we get over the amazement of the story and questions start to come. At least they do for me. The first question is, what is the significance of the 12 baskets? Where did the 12 baskets come from? Did Jesus travel around with his disciples in 12 empty baskets? And what did they do with the 12 baskets of leftover bread fragments? Well, I don't have any real answer for those questions. I do think, however, that the 12 baskets of leftovers were consumed by Jesus and his traveling companions at the next meal. If we read scripture often enough, we will see a repeating pattern of numbers throughout Scripture. The numbers 3, 7, 12, and 40 are the ones that you see throughout Scripture. So I can't help but think that perhaps the 12 baskets represent the 12 disciples and how Jesus filled them with faith. The last part of the scripture that I want to examine is the last verse. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Again, more questions as I ponder and study scripture. In this gospel, why did John not make any mention of Jesus telling him, telling his disciples to leave without him like he did in the other gospels? And why did they? Why did they leave Jesus? And why did Jesus go up onto the mountain to be by himself? There are a couple of things that we can learn here from Jesus. First is the humility and self-denial of the Lord Jesus. When the people would have come and made him king, he departed. He left, he had, here he has left a testimony and a lesson for each of us. A lesson against ambition and pretentiousness of worldly honor. Be humble always and don't ever pretend to be more than you have called to be. Jesus came down into the plain to feed the people and then return to the mountain alone to be private. Jesus teaches us to sequester ourselves from the world now and then, to free ourselves to converse with God and our very own souls. Public service must never push out private devotional time. Private devotional time is essential to our spiritual growth and to our faith. 
So here are the main points that I want you to remember today. Read scripture as part of your daily devotional time so you can become familiar with the word of God. Study scripture in small groups because it is a wonderful place to discover the greater lessons to be learned. When we study and ponder scripture in small groups, we can learn more than meets the eye. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.